Well, it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the, at the uh, Critical Issues uh, Forum. I think this is the third of these uh, meetings that I've uh, had the honor to participate in, and uh, I'm a great supporter of the concept of this, uh, this initiative. But I think the discussion that we just had around the table uh, was one of the best that I've, that I, that I've heard, and it, I think it uh, bodes well for this particular group to have a freewheeling and open uh, conversation over the next couple of days. So uh, again, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Craig Smith. I uh, work for Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, but I'm actually on assignment at the Naval Postgraduate School right here in Monterey, uh, where I've been for the last uh, six years. So I kind of wear two hats. Uh, and I have the task uh, this morning of uh, talking to you about the question, what, what are nuclear weapons? Now, that question could either be a very simple question with a very easy answer, or it could be an incredibly complex uh, question to, to go into. We need to thread the needle on that. From the, from the simple side, I, I did a quick uh, Google search on, on that question, what, what are nuclear weapons? And I got a couple of different uh, answers. One. Uh, a weapon of mass destruction where, uh, whose explosive power uh, derives from nuclear reaction. Or another one was a general name given to any weapon in which explosion results from the energy released by reactions involving atomic nuclei. Uh, a, th a third one, uh, weapons that use nuclear energy to explode. Nuclear weapons can be bombs or missiles. Well, of course, that last one confuses what is a nuclear weapon with how is it delivered? And so, uh, I think you could probably criticize any of these simplistic uh, answers. Uh, on the other extreme, uh, to go into the, the, the complete depth of a discussion of the history and technology of nuclear weapons would take a lot more time than we have here. And there are other reasons why we can't do it. Um, the back, background that is required to even understand some of the aspects of it uh, is, uh, is, is, is quite a bit, and it takes a long time to accumulate. Uh, the, uh, the technologies that we're talking about, in many cases, are uh, protected by security uh, rules, so there's limitations to what we can talk about. Uh, anyway, I don't think it would be all that interesting. So the task that we have is over the next 40 minutes, we're going to kind of go through some of the history and the technology of nuclear weapons, and hopefully uh, talk about some things that uh, will give you some insights that, that you don't already have to learn a little bit about this from both the historical and the technology standpoint. I was very happy as we went around the table to hear that a number of uh, you are teachers in the, the field of history, so, uh, so we will talk a little bit about the historical uh, context as well. <coughs> Speaking of history, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, this is a uh, representation of the four elements of the ancient world, earth, air, water, fire. I think we're all familiar with this. This goes back thousands of years to a concept that the Greeks uh, developed. And today we would probably view this as a very simplified and um, maybe even an incorrect view of the nature of substance. And so while, while this might be considered historically interesting but wrong, it's also true that the ancient Greeks came up with some other ideas, including the idea of the atomic <coughs> nature of matter. This was fundamentally an idea that came out of the ancient Greeks thousands of years ago. And they viewed uh, substance as being comprised of atoms, which were small, that were, they were basically indivisible units of, of matter, and that they were unchanging. And so if we want to be critical about it, we could, we could talk about those three attributes. When I said small, they had no idea how small uh, atoms that, that we uh, understand exist now really are. So they used the word small, but they really uh, would be, I think, very surprised at how small these things really are. Uh, we say they're um, indivisible. Well, we know now that they're really not, that uh, atoms are uh, divisible, they have component parts, and so on, and that they're unchanging. And normally atoms don't change very rapidly, but we know in radioactive decay, for example, uh, that uh, atoms uh, do change. So, <clears throat> so this second idea coming out of the Greek uh, philosophy, uh, we often take as being a much more accurate view of the reality that, that we have uh, now, and yet, once again, you can go through point by point and say it really wasn't correct, 
but it was just closer to what, to what we believe now. You move forward into the Middle Ages, there was a, 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 a theoretical field of alchemy. Um, I, I hesitate to call it a science because we, we think of it as maybe more of a religion. Um, but in fact, these were people who sought to figure out ways to change a substance from one type of substance to another, to take base metals like lead and turn them into gold. This was what they sought. And I think here, once again, we would view this as a concept in the, in the modern world that was far from the truth, that was uh, more religion than, than science. And yet, in the modern era, we know that it is possible to change substance from one element to, to another. So, while the, the Greek atomists, we think, were right, but you can go down and show how they were wrong at the detail level. Uh, the alchemists, we say, were wrong, but in fact, it turns out they were actually right in some way. So we, we come up closer to the modern world, and Dmitri uh, Mendeleev had a new vision of matter based on periodicity of, of the elements. Uh, and this is just basically leading us to our modern understanding of substances and, uh, and, and materials, but this is a very, very important uh, benchmark. And it led us to this chart of the periodic table of the elements. What Mendeleev uh, recognized was that if you line things up on a, on a chart like this, you find chemical characteristics that are held in common by elements that are, are in a row. And that this gives us a great basis for a framework for understanding of, uh, of chemistry. Uh, also, interestingly, if you get out here to the very bottom of the chart and you start with uranium, and you move your way up, you realize that there are, uh, that all of these elements are radioactive. <laughs> Radioactivity was a parameter or a uh, characteristic of matter that was only discovered in uh, the recent century uh, and which led to some kind of overturning of uh, scientists' view of, of the universe and, of course, which also has an important bearing on the subject that we're talking about today. So we have uh, other uh, iconic uh, historical figures, uh, Henri Becquerel and uh, the, the Curies. The, this takes us to the beginning of the 20th century, where discoveries related to uh, radioactivity and uh, other effects, including the, the, the photoelectric effect, uh, were, were found to be inconsistent with the ideas of physics that had emerged going back into the 15th, uh, 16th and 17th century. So at the beginning of the 20th century, there was this sense, at least held by a lot of people, that we pretty fully understood matter and, and science and physics. And yet there were these annoying deviations or anomalies with radioactivity, photoelectric effect, and a few other things that led to uh, some of the new understandings in the, uh, the 20th century. So, we, we now have uh, a, a theory that, that uh, re reflects the fundamental particles that which uh, substance is made, including uh, the neutron, proton. Protons and neutrons are combined into a nucleus in some way. And if you look closely at, a, at a, one of these fundamental particles, the neutron or the proton, you'll see that there's structure inside with uh, what are called quarks. And I won't go into that any further here, but, uh, but it's a, just an interesting uh, perspective on our, our current view of how substances are uh, made. So some basic ba background on nuclear reactions and what are they? Well, first of all, I would say all materials are made up of atoms. That's just a statement, and that could be challenged. In fact, in fact let me challenge it. I would say, in the universe, apparently, most material is not made up of atoms. Or at least we don't know what it's made up of, because there's this mysterious substance called dark matter. And there's other materials, like neutrinos, that are not made up of atoms. So, but everyday life, when you look around you in the room, you touch the desk and you, you know, sense yourself, it's made up of atoms. Atoms consist of nuclei, and 
swarms of electrons. And so this is the picture here. And while it, it, early on there was a planetary view of, uh, of, of the atom, really the way, the way it's viewed now is that you have a central nucleus surrounded by a cloud or a swarm of, of electrons. Nuclei are made up of various combinations of protons and neutrons. The number of protons in a nucleus tells you what that element is. The number of neutrons added to those protons doesn't change the chemical behavior of the material or its name as an element, but it changes it from one isotope to another depending on how, how many neutrons there are. So the important point here is that chemistry comes from the interactions between the electron swarms of atoms, between adjacent atoms with their electron swarms. That's what, that's what a chemical reaction is. A nuclear reaction, on the other hand, involves the nuclei rather than the electrons. So that's really the first kind of a fundamental thing to, to be aware of. So historically speaking, we talked about events leading up until the beginning of the, the 20th century. We even have to move another 40 years to about 1938 when the process of fission was first uh, discovered. This was discovered in, uh, in pre-war Nazi Germany. Uh, there were three scientists, uh, Otto Hahn, Fritz Stratzmann, and and Lee Meitner, who were most heavily involved in this, in this discovery. By the way, Hahn and Strassman got the Nobel uh, Prize. Somehow, uh, Meitner was left off. This is, it seems like to a lot of people kind of an injustice. They were taking uh, material, in this case uranium, and bombarding it with neutrons. And this was kind of in the, the heyday of the realization that the the view of the alchemist is actually kind of right. Because if you take a material and you bombard it with neutrons, you can change that elemental substance from one element to another. So scientists around the world were taking materials, bombarding them with neutrons, to, change, to, to observe changing from one element to another. This was kind of a, a cutting edge but widespread practice. What Hahn, Strassmann, and Lise Meitner did that was a little bit different was they took the heaviest element that, they, that existed at the time, uranium, and bombarded it with neutrons in the hope that when the neutrons collided and stuck in, in, with the, uh, the atom of uranium, with the nucleus of uranium, that it would create something heavier and therefore something new, a new element beyond uranium. This is what they were looking for. But what they found was that they were getting multiple um, fission products, as we know them now, multiple products that were lighter than uranium, a lot lighter, close something in the range of half the mass of uranium. So they, they found that the uranium was fissioning and breaking up into two roughly equal pieces. Not exactly equal, there's always an asymmetry, but two pieces that were smaller, but which when you add them together, added up to the same uh, total mass that you started with. And they also found that there were additional neutrons coming out. So you were bombarding them, these uh, atoms with neutrons, and then you were getting not only fission products, but also more neutrons. And here's the picture here showing what was going on. A neutron was coming into a target nucleus, in this case of uranium, and it was releasing fission products, multiple neutrons. In this picture, it shows three plus energy, and that's a lot of energy. I'll talk about how much in a, in a little bit. Was there a question? So there are more neutrons than the original? So no. The free, these are free neutrons coming out of the nucleus. That were originally attached. And they, were, they were neutrons that came out of the, the nucleus. So that's okay. like new neutrons. That's right. No, no. They, if, you, if you add up all the neutrons here, it'll equal, it'll, the, it'll equal the, some of the reaction. How, uh, how, this has always intrigued me, I mean, I know they're doing things in France and we're, we're working on things to create this centrifugal thing that throw things into each other. What was the mechanism they were using to bombard these with each other? What was it? It was sim simply a, uh, they had uh, developed a, a procedure by which they could produce neutrons. So if you take some radioactive material like radium, for example, and you combine it with another material like uh, beryllium, you can get a, a reaction that will spontaneously release neut neutrons. So they have these neutron sources. These were, these were uh, sources based on existing natural 
uh, material. So once they discovered that you could produce neutrons, then the fun began with experiments to see what new materials you could you create by bombarding other substances with the neutrons that you produced in this. Uh, so this process. would be some type of a box. It would be. It's. I mean, in fact, this is the. This is the apparatus here. This is a photograph of the apparatus in which the fission process was discovered. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I guess what you're asking, like, did they, how did they smack into yeah, the yeah, brain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so, like, did they just, like, throw one and the other one and, like, you just have you just, you just have a source of neutrons which which could be coming out of a uh, group, uh, 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 a small quantity of material, like, of the nature I just mentioned, uh, uh, spewing out neutrons in all directions, and you bring your target material in its proximity. It's not like a gun, you're not channeling oh, it. It's, it's not like a, uh, an accelerator. They haven't been embedded, embedded yeah, so yet. That's, that's what I was yeah. It's just exposing one kind of material to another type, which is a source of neutrons. And how do they measure, measure that? How do they measure the, the product? Yeah. They do radiochemical uh, or chemical processing on the, on the product. They would have to go through very meticulous uh, dissolving of the material in acid, and chemical uh, standard chemical uh, techniques to separate <coughs> separate out the, the resultant materials. So what they would do is they would find that maybe they were they were coming up with uh, with calcium or strontium or or barium as that they that they, they knew what its chemistry looked like and that was coming out of a reaction involving uranium, a much heavier material. So they knew they knew right away that this was something very very special and very different. This was a shot heard around the world. And the scientific community uh, became immediately aware, and uh, scientists all over the world immediately jumped to the conclusion that the fact that the splitting of this atom can result in more neutrons than you started with, and a lot of energy, meant that there could be uh, the opportunity for a chain reaction release of large amounts of energy, which could be used for production of energy for civilian purposes, but also if that energy is released fast enough, it could be explosive. And so the military programs uh, came on the scene. Just another picture kind of at the uh, uh, blown up uh, level of what, what's happening here. A neutron comes in to a uranium-235 atom. It creates a compound nucleus, which ultimately splits, and once again, two fission products, three neutrons. Doesn't need to be this way. Sometimes there's three, sometimes there might be four, sometimes there might be two. Uh, there could even be more than, than two fission products, but this is a typical reaction. So, you have the idea of a chain reaction, critical mass, and the role of uranium-235 and plutonium. And these are probably terms that you've, you've heard of, um, maybe, at least, uh, uh, the point here is that at least one fission neutron must cause another fission in order to sustain a chain reaction. If every fission that you have creates enough neutrons so that one of, one of those neutrons survives to cause another fission, then you have a condition that we call criticality. It's a self-sustaining nuclear reaction. This is what you try to achieve in a nuclear reactor. You try to achieve this exact balance so that you're releasing a lot of energy but the power of the reactor is not either increasing or decreasing. It's exactly equal. That's criticality. In the case of a weapon, you want it to be super critical. You want it to be releasing more and more energy as time goes on until it blows itself apart. So there's some important differences between nuclear reactor technology and nuclear weapons technology. It comes from the same physics, though. Critical mass depends on what the material is its geometry, and its density. And as I said, if you have more than one fission neutron uh, coming out, uh, causing a, a, a next generation fission, then the reaction can rapidly expand and potentially become explosive. And this is kind of a fundamental uh, physical concept behind the, uh, the idea of nuclear weapons. Question? I, uh, I was reading uh, last year, a year before, one of Richard Rhodes' books, um, Dark Sun, I think, and one of the first, and I, I forgot which one was on the atomic one and what was on the hydrogen bomb. I, I get those confused. That was the hydrogen bomb. Okay, right. That's what I thought. And when they <coughs> dropped the, the detonated the first hydrogen bomb, wasn't there some concern that 
they weren't quite certain that the chain reaction would cease? Or could, was that well, just no, it was, it, See, this was a, a, different, a different thing because, uh, and, and I, I won't get into a lot of detail on this, but just in answer to your question, you have a, a fission process, which I've described. There's also a fusion process, and that's what makes it a thermonuclear weapon. And uh, with the, the conditions for fusion are very different than the conditions for fission. In fission, you're, you're talking about having the correct geometry, density, and right materials to propagate these neutrons so that you can continue a neutron-induced reaction. With fusion, you're talking about maintaining very high temperature and pressure and density, which create conditions for the fusion reaction to take place, which is the reaction that you see every day if you look up in the sky and look at the sun. So it's a, it's a, it's a very different thing. But there, there may have been some concern in the early thermonuclear uh, days that if you triggered a fusion reaction that it could spread and engulf the world. I mean, it was a, it was a very far-fetched idea, but I'm, I'm sure there were some people who, who thought about that. Well, they, they thought the same thing that Alan Ward because they didn't even know what they was going to happen. They didn't know what was going to happen. That's, that's correct. All right, so now if you look at, at atoms, and you look at the energy that is contained in gluing together the, the neutrons and protons within the nucleus, you can come up with an idea, uh, a, 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 a parameter called the binding energy per neutron. How much binding energy per nucleon? How much binding energy is there per unit uh, nucleon? Nucleon being either a proton or a neutron. And so that can be plotted, and that's what this red line, this red line here is. And it just basically shows how material substances. Uh, uh, exist in terms of this binding energy per nu a nucleon, with uh, hydrogen 2 being uh, down here very low, uh, iron 58 being at the top, and then if you go on out here, you're coming out to the heavy materials like, uh, like uranium. So once you've, you've plotted this, you can realize that there's this region of stability right up in here. And so in a way, if uh, you're free to move <coughs> nucleons around, uh, materials would like to become like iron. That's the place that they'd like to be. That's the place where they have the highest amount of uh, captured energy per, uh, per nucleon. So what it, what it says is that if you, if you take something from down here, like hydrogen 2, and you combine it into a heavier form, you're moving up on this list, and that means that you can have a release of energy from the fusion of nuclei. And so fusion energy is a release of energy that takes you from here up to here. Fission, on the other hand, is where you come from out here and you split the nucleus apart and that releases energy from these heavy materials because it puts them in a more stable situation up here. So it is the release of energy from splitting heavy nuclei or from combining light ones that we're talking about here. And this is per nucleon. So remember, uranium-235, uranium for example, has 235 nuclei, or nucleons. <coughs> so really, it's a little bit skewed, but you get a lot of energy out of when you, when you conduct a, 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 a fission event. You also get a lot of energy released <coughs> on the fusion side. Oh, I got a graphics problem here. Uh, if you could see this picture, it would show the uh, first nuclear uh, reactor, the first man-made nuclear reactor, which was built by Enrico Fermi and operated at the uh, University of Chicago. And uh, this was only a couple of years after the discovery of fission. It's a remarkable event. I'm sorry I don't have the picture here. It's because of an incompatibility between the, the Macintosh and the and the Windows uh, system, but uh, but I'm sure this is something that's easy enough to find. And it was uh, uh, just a remarkable event, in my in my opinion, that it could it could have been developed in such a short period of time. But if this was under the period of time when we had this program called the um, Manhattan uh, Project, which uh, which gave us uh, a lot of funding and a lot of secre secrecy to develop reactors. Uh, material processing capability, enrichment, uh, weapons uh, testing, and, and all the other things that we're, we're aware of. 
So, very quickly, after the development of this first reactor, in the Manhattan Project, we had a couple of different things going on. We had the development of enrichment of uranium by gaseous diffusion. And this is just a, uh, just a sketch of one of the devices. And at the, simultaneously, we had uh, the building of a large number of reactors, nuclear reactors, big ones, up in the state of Washington primarily, that produced plutonium. The two materials that you can most commonly use in a fission device are uranium-235, which exists in a very small fraction of natural uranium, less than 1%, or plutonium-239, which doesn't exist in any appreciable amount in nature, but which can be produced by this same process of irradiating uranium with neutrons and creating something a little heavier. That little, something a little heavier is plutonium. And either of those two methods can uh, be used as uh, weapons material. So now we're in 1945. There's, this is an attack at Mag Nagasaki, which is the second uh, use of uh, a nuclear weapon in the war. Um, there were 286,000 people living in Nagasaki. 74,000 were killed and another 75,000 sustained severe injuries. This is the picture of the, of the device, and this is a, a picture of the explosion. It's a very sobering thing. Uh, I could have shown you some videos or pictures, but I'm sure you've probably seen such things in the past. The power of the energy released in a nuclear reaction is uh, almost unbelievable. So what's difficult about making nuclear weapons? Well, as I just said, there's only, only the rare natural isotope U-235 and the artificial uh, element of plutonium, mainly plutonium-239, are, uh, are you know, uh, reasonably available to sustain fast nuclear chain reaction. Uh, so making these materials are one of the main obstacles to, uh, to a nuclear weapons program. I won't say it's the only one, but a successful weapons program can cost uh, on the order of a billion dollars. Unsuccessful programs can cost even more. Uh, so th those, are, those are basically uh, some of the obstacles that we, uh, that we, we can talk about. Uh, there are two well-known methods for initiating a fission explosion, and they're shown here. Uh, the first is the gun assembly. And the example is Little Boy, which was the uh, which is one of the first two weapons that was used. Uh, and what you need here is you have to have an amount of uranium-235 which is greater than this critical amount. The critical amount being the amount where, if it's in the right geometry, will sustain a, a, a chain reaction. You need more than that in order to have it not just sustain the chain reaction, but to have uh, a growing and exploding nuclear reaction. Uh, but this method is somewhat inefficient. You're not compressing the materials and creating higher densities in this, this kind of a, a concept. Uh, so you need to keep a lot of this uh, material together to get a good yield. Uh, safety is an issue, but the design was so simple that no test was required. And in fact, in the first uh, uh, use of this was the use in the war. It had never been tested. And we think of the Trinity test being the first test of a nuclear weapon, and it was. But this was an alternate design which didn't need to be tested. It was so uh, straightforward. But it does have these other difficulties. The second method is called implosion. And the example is Fat Man. This was the second one uh, that was used in the, in the war. Um, it uh, requires much less than a critical mass of plutonium uh, in, its, in its conventional configuration. Of course, it becomes uh, supercritical when it's compressed and the densities and the geometry is changed and the densities are much greater. Uh, it gives a very efficient uh, number of kilotons per kilograms uh, is, is much higher. So these are two different approaches that have different designs and different materials associated with them. To, to say a little bit more about that, uh, we have um, a, a sketch here of a simple gun assembled uh, nuclear weapon which is uh, like a gun tube with two subcritical masses, but each of those subcritical masses are more than half of a subcritical, uh, more than half of a critical mass. And a propellant, or an, 
explosive, which when it's ignited, it propels these two pieces together very rapidly into a supercritical configuration. And uh, the fissile material is uncompressed. Large amounts of highly enriched uranium are needed for this. And the assembly is relatively slow. Uh, the second sketch, uh, which is not necessarily a very good graphic here, but uh, you know, basically what you have is you have a, a subcritical mass, which is called a pit, surrounded by high explosives, which aren't showing up on this graphic, but you can imagine high explosives surrounding a central core. When those high explosives are detonated, that explodes, and the explosive forces go in both directions. It's uh, simply Newton's law. The inward force causes a dramatic compression of this previously un a subcritical mass of plutonium and an increase of density to the point that it becomes supercritical. So this is the second concept, and the fissile material that we're talking about here is plutonium. The uh, implosion velocity is much greater than the gun velocity in the previous concept. The gun velocity is slow by comparison. This is a very, very fast uh, explosion. And the explosion compresses the fissile core, and it means that you can get away with a much smaller mass of nuclear material in order to have such a device. So, well, just, so these are the two basic concepts for a fission nuclear weapon. And not much has changed over the years. I mean, a, a lot has changed uh, in, in the details of design, but not much has changed in terms of the physics. The, uh, the two concepts have um, been used in uh, many different uh, weapons designs for fission weapons. The, we talked a little bit uh, ago about thermonuclear weapons and introduction of fusion, and I'm not going to go into much detail on that here, but uh, as a trigger for a thermonuclear device, you normally need one of these fission uh, devices, and so this tends to be the long pole in the tent, if you, if you will, and the primary focus uh, of um, um, concern about uh, non-proliferation and uh, other topics that, that we've been talking about here. Excuse me, uh, yes. did you just uh, uh, repeat that? Because I'm trying to get, is, is getting a fusion device easier to get a hold of, or is a fission device the more powerful one, and thus, because you have to use this plutonium, which has to be created in yeah. a... Uh, in order to create the conditions for a fusion, for a thermonuclear detonation, you need to have such extreme temperatures, pressures, and densities that you need a fission device to do it. So what I'm saying is the two are associated. So no, it, it would never be easier to have a thermonuclear device because part of the thermonuclear device is a fission device. Right, so that's what I'm saying. That, to me, fission, all right, because I was... I thought the fusion was the thermonuclear, and that was what was more difficult. I got that. But no, the, the fusion. When we say thermonuclear, we're talking about fusion. We're talking about fusion. Right. Uh, about the uh, fusion of hydrogen isotopes into uh, higher uh, elements <coughs> and the release of a lot of energy. But in order to create that condition, you need to have a fission uh, explosion. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You're saying that the fission is the, the initiating factor. Right. It's like the gunpowder in the... Well, and, it, and it, you can have a fission device all by itself, which is, the, of course, what uh, the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, designs were all about. That was before there was even any uh, fusion um, element. Okay. So let's uh, continue this kind of survey through, through the world of nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a, a topic on the scale of nuclear weapons, going from these gigantic uh, fission-only uh, bombs. Uh, over the years, the designs have been miniaturized and uh, made uh, more complex. This is a re-entry re vehicle, nose cone for a missile. And you can see contained within that capsule are multiple independently targetable nuclear weapons. And so uh, size and scope, this is you know the picture of a, of a, of a person standing next to multiple nuclear weapons on the top of a missile. Uh, each re-entry vehicle uh, it, it contains one weapon. Uh, 
the, uh, the yield of each of these is maybe tens of times the bomb that was used in Hiroshima. And in the case of submarine launched missiles, uh, you can have maybe 20 of these missiles, each with uh, multiple reentry vehicles. So uh, a nuclear armed submarine can be uh, one of the most powerful uh, destructive entities in the world if you want to look at it. That's uh, one of the things that you're going to want to consider and think about when you begin talking about the treaties, because they're reducing two different kinds of things. They're reducing the delivery vehicle. But remember, the delivery vehicle also has up to, I don't know, five, ten, five reentry vehicles on top. So they want to reduce those as well as the number of these. So I just kind of, we're backtracking a little bit, but this is the picture of the little boy uh, device, gun type device, which is easier to design and build. This is the Hiroshima bomb, never tested before it was used. And it was about 13 kilotons of explosive yield. That's equivalent to 13,000 tons of TNT. This is a picture of the Nagasaki bomb called Fat Man. About 22 kilotons explosive yield. It was the second time an implosion weapon had been detonated. The first time was in New Mexico at the Trinity test site. And it, and, and it required testing to prove the concept because it was a much more complex uh, engineering uh, problem. Uh, much more efficient design than, than the little boy design. So now we come to some of what some modern nuclear weapons might, uh, might look like. The, the modern nuclear weapon which consists of thousands of parts. You have a physics package, which is really what the, the nuclear weapon part of it is. Um, you have, uh, in this case, a picture of some reentry vehicles that are part of mul multiply, multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles, MIRVs. If you or your students are interested, that picture on the left was the cover of a Scientific American within the last 10 to 12 years. So you only have between 120 and 144 issues to search through <laughs> to find that. And then the article on the inside will give you a more detailed explanation of what all those parts are. But that was the cover of Scientific, Scientific American within the last 12 years. In terms of strategic nuclear weapons, we have these, these submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, this shows a number of the, uh, the missile concepts uh, when, they were, when they were built, how big they are, how they're deployed, and some photos of, of their um, actual launching. ICBMs are a second type of strategic weapon. You can see one here in a silo control center uh, being paraded in Beijing. I believe this is a Russian concept. And again, you can have them multiple re independently re targetable. Now the, uh, the ICBMs on those trucks, are those like, can those trucks actually shoot them? Yeah. So they can, so like the, the rocket itself. It's a mobile is, launcher. I got it. So the rocket itself is capable. And the third part of the triad, as we, we call it, the air-launched air, uh, uh, weapons. Uh, this is the B-52, uh, an aircraft that was capable of, uh, of launching nuclear weapons. And this is a very old airplane, the B-2, which is one of the newest ones. Uh, this is a Russian design. And this is an air-launched cruise missile. In terms of tactical nuclear weapons, question? Do all the current nuclear states have the triad, the big triad? No. Which, which do? The United States, Russia, France, and Britain have elements. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to sp speak to it uh, directly, but. Uh, um, you know, uh, and then and then China, of course, has a pretty full capability, but I, I honestly don't know what their uh, submarine capability is. I don't believe they have nuclear-powered submarines, and whether they have launch capability, I, I, 
that, that's out of my... Isn't it also, I understand that Britain for sure and maybe France are dependent on part of their delivery system on the United States, so that that could be withdrawn. In other words, they could still have a, a bond, the Trident, for instance, the, the, the British use Trident. The Trident could be the cease delivery of that. Well, sell a I think I'll have to leave you for your research on, on, on that. That's probably not a topic I can, I can discuss. Uh, so, tactical nuclear weapons, bombs, Pershing missiles. This is a picture of sometimes called a suitcase nuke. Davy Crockett was an old weapon system, Russian theater missile. Now, some of these are obsolete. Many of them are out of the arsenal altogether, but these are some of the ideas that uh, have been developed in the past. The Davy Crockett was a handheld launcher? It was, I think, I think it was mounted. A mounted one. Yeah. Okay. Do suitcase nips exist today? Don't, I'm sorry, not me to ask the question. No, uh, yes. there, there are. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Exist. Exist, yes. The nuclear weapons effects, let's talk a little bit about that. This, this is uh, some of the leaders from the Manhattan Project at the uh, results of the Trinity test. Uh, mushroom cloud over Nagasaki. Blue stone test in, uh, in the Pacific in 1962. Uh, if you look at the nuclear weapons effects, we, we, we often think that nuclear weapons um, have uh, effects that are somehow fundamentally different than other conventional weapons, but that's not really, that's not really true. There is an element of difference, but 50% nominally is blast energy. And of course, that's what you're trying to achieve in any kind of a uh, explosive uh, uh, device. 35% thermal, and then 15% is in the form of nuclear uh, radiation. And these are, uh, of course, this pie chart may vary from weapon to weapon and all the rest of that, but this is just kind of nominally about what we're talking about here. So you have blast, you have a thermal pulse, you have neutrons, you have x-rays and gamma rays, which these are all part of the radiation, thermal radiation, electromagnetic pulse is a, uh, another effect that uh, has been studied and evaluated both in, in Russia and in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, you have ionization in the upper atmosphere, and you have this phenomenon of uh, fallout, that is the activation of materials to make them radioactive and then they can settle back down to earth in fine particulate form but as a radioactive material which is hazardous. Quick word as I'm running out of time on radiological weapons. Uh, now these are not technically speaking what we think of as a fission or a nuclear weapon. What they are is what we sometimes call a dirty bomb. There's actually been no actual terrorist use of dirty bombs, um, and really uh, no use in warfare between nations. Uh, apparently Iraq had tested radiological weapons, uh, but it was a failed attempt. Um, and the United States abandoned their efforts in this direction in World War II. It's a pretty ineffective uh, kind of uh, weapon because it doesn't have any particular destructive power other than denial of uh, real estate and, and maybe uh, use as a, as a terrorist uh, weapon. It's really not a weapon of mass destruction. <coughs> However, the raw materials are easier to acquire than for a nuclear weapon. Uh, it can cause a lot of panic. might not cause a lot of casualties, but it will cause a lot of uh, reaction. Uh, and apparently there has been some expressed interest in behalf of groups like Al-Qaeda in acquiring uh, such, uh, such weapons. Fundamentally different. A radiological weapon is radioactive material which is dispersed by an explosive, a conventional explosive, and, uh, and therefore it has radioactivity, but it is not a nuclear uh, weapon in the conventional sense. So what do you need for a nuclear, for, uh, radio, for, for radiological weapon, a dirty bomb, you need uh, radioactive source material, but those are all over the place. We use them in medicine, food irradiation, research, industrial uh, gauging, oil prospecting. Uh, there are radioactive materials. Uh, it's a naturally occurring uh, substance, and so that's easy enough to find. You could use something like spent nuclear fuel or the product of reprocessing of nuclear fuel, nuclear waste. Uh, and then there's other radioactive materials like depleted uranium, which in fact 
are used in weapons, but the radioactivity is not the reason it's used. It's, it's, it's very high density is the reason it's used. How do you disperse it? Well, conventional explosive, TNT or other conventional explosive. Uh, you could have uh, an improvised nuclear device which didn't work, and then it really effectively acts like a radiological weapon. Uh, there could be dispersal in aerosolized particles and in contamination of water supplies. So this is really a, a, a weapon of terror though, rather than a, a, a military weapon. So let me wrap up so we have some time for, uh, for additional discussion. Uh, the introduction of nuclear weapons in the middle of the 20th century really did change the world. It has had a profound change. And uh, I think the discussion before I got started was maybe leading down uh, some of the geopolitical paths that, uh, that have been created as a result of that. Uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and other arms control agreements have established what I call an imperfect framework for controlling uh, the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, my personal opinion is that this treaty has been unusually successful, but I don't think anybody would say it was perfect. The technology of nuclear weapons is difficult and expensive to master but not impossible, and you can look around the world and see the examples. Uh, the world of the 21st century remains dangerous. Boy, that might be an understatement. Perhaps it's more dangerous than it was before, who knows? Uh, that's, uh, that's a debatable point, and much remains to be done. That's why you're here. So I'll stop at that point and uh, see if there are any other questions or discussion. Uh, in terms of human lives, Hiroshima was much more devastating than Nagasaki. However, the atomic bomb at Nagasaki was 22 kilotons, and the Hiroshima was 13. So is it geography, layout of the land, dispersal of radiation? Yeah, that, that difference, I, I, I believe that difference had a lot to do with uh, um, target location and so on. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been to these places, maybe, Masako, you yeah, yeah, right. The, the, some structure of the cities, and also maybe the weather might have been some yeah. element. So, so if, you, if, you, if you ever have the chance to visit uh, Nagasaki, I can recommend it. It's a really beautiful mm -hmm. city. It reminds me a little bit of San Francisco, and its hills. Uh, and the interesting thing is, in the center of the city, in the harbor area, they have um, wooden structures that date back to the 1500s that are... Um, Christian Western churches and things that had been just introduced to Japan, they're still standing. So ground zero was sufficiently removed from the center of the city that, uh, and, I, and I, I honestly don't know whether that was uh, uh, by intent or by, by error. But in both cases, the number of uh, deaths that we're talking about, order of magnitude, are huge. Um, yet, when I read definitions of nuclear weapons as saying they're the most uh, deadly weapons, I think we also know that the firebombing of Tokyo uh, resulted in far more uh, casualties. So, you know, these, these are all debatable points. I have a question for the group. How many of the, how many of the domains did he cover in this talk? Or did he touch on? How many of the domains, the CIF domains, did he touch on in this talk? <laughs> Good job. Well, I focused on one anyway. <laughs> yes, he focused on one. But the others were mentioned. Historical, political, economic was in there. He mentioned it in his conclusion. The Indian and Pakistani weapons, are they uranium or plutonium? Uh, they may have multiple systems. Uh, the uh, the Indian system, um, yeah, I, I believe I believe they're plutonium systems, but I but I don't know for sure, and I probably can't get into any of the details on it unless you know something from the unclassified. Yeah, Dr. Joshi will cover that tomorrow, Thank so you. he'd be a really good yeah. person for that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the uh, new new programs, for example, the Korean uh, North Korean program. I mean, they've, they've headed down both paths. Joel asked about Nagasaki, I think. Well, Nagasaki wasn't the original target. 
No, well, I mean, it was, it was the target, but it was so, uh, selected in a process. I mean, one of the problems in... No, but I mean, what happened was the, 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 the main target was covered over, and right. they couldn't figure out how to bomb it, so sure. they went to Nagasaki instead. As an alternate, right. Yeah. Yes. So the, uh, the mains, uh, were, were they both airburst or one ground burst or... No, they were both airbursts with uh, radar altimeter triggering. And this was based on the uh, calculation of how to get the maximum, you know, bang for the buck, if you will. Um, back in the Reagan administration, there was talk about a so-called neutron bomb. Mm -hmm. And you made mention of neutrons in one of your slides. I wonder if you can say anything about yeah, that. Yeah, um, basically what, what uh, they've looked at over the years are, are ways that they can have uh, either reduced fallout or enhanced radiation uh, output from uh, by, by virtue of the design of the weapon. And so, so the neutron bomb or the enhanced radiation bomb was designed so that it could uh, minimize the collateral damage and, the, uh, and the, the dispersal of radioactive materials which would prevent reoccupation or reuse but would simply, you know, uh, kill people. And so that was that, that's the concept there. Those uh, those types of weapons have been uh, designed and built and fielded, and I don't know where they stand uh, now. But it's just uh, these are variations on the on the design, and this was a particular design which was intended to enhance the neutrons and other uh, radiation, and, while reducing the amount of uh, activated material that could be uh, fallout. Uh, in terms of the material, is it um, looking at a political option as a leverage for one state or a group of states to use against one state that continues to produce nuclear weapons of some sort? Um, is there uh, is there a location that could be secured that would prevent acquisition of that material and therefore be one of the key <coughs> pieces missing in creating a bomb? One of the one of the ideas of the original Atoms for Peace program would be the creation of an international depository for fissile material. It was never implemented, but it has been uh, brought up in renewed discussions in in recent years. The idea that uh, enrichment technology uh, should be perhaps controlled and access to fissile material for peaceful nuclear energy use is guaranteed to, say, member states of the NPT, for example. Uh, and this is an idea. This is part one of the ideas that I think is bouncing, uh, bouncing around now. I mean, there's, there is a belief that if you look at what's happened over the 50 years since Adam for Peace, that it was a very successful program, and that along with NPT and the International Atomic Energy Agency has been mostly successful, not completely <coughs> successful. And so the question is, well, how could it be tweaked in some way as to improve prospects for the, for the future? And so you look at um, things like uh, Libya and uh, Korea and Iran and Syria. And I mean, each of these is a somewhat different problem. And so the question is, institutionally, how could the world community create uh, a revised regime that would um, improve situations and take away those those limited number of areas where we haven't been fully successful. Yes. How are um, when when you're talking about uh, Germany and the um, uh, fission reaction? Uh, how are uh, Han Stra Strassman and Meitner related? I mean. They work, they work together in the laboratory. Were they co They're co workers? Co workers in the laboratory, but but my understanding is that at least Meitner um, fled Germany and uh, to Scandinavia, but kept in touch. And so she was a uh, very important contributor to the to the ideas and interpretation of the results of these experiments. I think Han was the lead professor. The other two were junior professors. Somebody mentioned the 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 books 
by uh, Richard Rhodes, and there are uh, two of them. One is the making of the atomic bomb, and the other is uh, Dark Sun. And uh, they are really superb Pulitzer Prize winning books that, uh, that detail what was really going on. And I mean, I think that they're really quite, uh, quite interesting for anyone who is interested in either the history of the Manhattan Project on the development of nuclear weapons or the technology. It gives you really great uh, technology underpinning without requiring a, you know, a PhD in, in physics to understand. Yeah. What was Szilard's early role in the development when, when he was over in Europe before he came to America? Was he there in 38, 39? Who was that? Zillard. Zillard, yeah. He was one, <coughs> Zillard was one of a uh, remarkable group of uh, Hungarians that uh, it's, it's uh, unbelievable to think that you could have this group of people, Zillard, um, Teller was another one. Uh, and so, I mean, it was incredible that you could have that level of ingenuity coming out of, uh, of a small country and, and Europe and all coming together. And, and he, was, um, he was one of the people that took the, uh, the concept to uh, Albert Einstein and, and, and resulted in uh, the letter from Einstein to Roosevelt that started the Manhattan Project. And in fact, Edward Teller was at that meeting uh, because uh, Sillar didn't have a driver's license. And so Teller was there as the driver, and of course became heavily involved. But it's a it's a it's a really an interesting story, the story of these uh, brilliant uh, Hungarian scientists that uh, all emerged. I, I like to think of it as uh, the fact that uh, the the improbability of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci being contemporaries in northern Italy at the same time in history. You know, per perhaps two of the greatest artists ever. What are the chances that they would both be contemporaries and similar kind of thing coming out of uh, Hungary? It must have been something in the water. Any, any other questions? Yeah, yeah uh, the, uh, the fusion, what do you get? Kind of like nuclear, thermonuclear uh, reactions. Is that just two hydrogen atoms like combined, or is that like a series of? No, but it's just, it's just uh, it is the combination of, of light nuclei, mainly of hydrogen. Uh, releasing huge amounts of energy, but it does. But it's hard to get the conditions for that to take place because you need very high temperature and density conditions in order for the nuclei to overcome their electrical repulsion. If you can overcome it, then it releases a large amount of energy. So, is all that heat that as a result of that reaction is that caused by the fission portion of it, and so like the thermo part of the nuclear? No, but when, when, when you have a thermonuclear, I mean. It, it depends on the particulars of the design, but the idea is that once you create the fusion uh, conditions, then you can get a much larger uh, yield. But there are tables that you can look at that say, okay, this is much. This is what you get the yield from fission. This is what you get from fusion. And there are lots of different designs ranging from a pure fission design to what they call a boosted fission design to a thermonuclear design. And uh, Design details are uh, something that aren't, aren't normally discussed much in, you know, in public. But uh, but there are articles and there's a, there's information that you can access that will get a pretty good description of that. Well, thank you very much. It's been my great pleasure to be here. Thanks very much. Okay, we have another break schedule now, so.